Okay, so we're going to start looking at a couple of big international agreements related to the global environment. Uh, while these agreements aren't sort of a comprehensive list, there's, there's dozens and dozens of other agreements out there that have been forged by states relating to specific problems like, you know, the shipping of, of waste from one country to another or dumping things in the Earth's o oceans. Um, these two examples that we'll talk about today, I think, make for an interesting case study um, and, and a comparison and contrast. So in the late 1980s, uh, the scientific community sort of brought to the attention of the world that there were some pretty pressing environmental problems on the horizon. Um, one of those problems was that the use of chlorofluorocarbons, which were used in refrigeration and aerosol cans and like air conditioners, um, that those chemicals, when they released up into the atmosphere, were bonding with ozone, which is O3, I guess, and resulting in the Earth's ozone layer, which absorbs some of the harmful ultraviolet light that would otherwise fry life on Earth, um, thinning that ozone layer out so there wasn't as, as much of that that um, ozone there to, to filter out um, harmful radiation, um, and that this was potentially a, a dangerous problem for, for the climate. Um, the second problem was that there was an accumulation of greenhouse gases uh, which included, you know, CO2, but also methane and those chlorofluorocarbons, as well as others, as they were accumulating in the Earth's atmosphere, um, it was creating sort of a greenhouse effect where um, high frequency radiation from the sun was coming in, it was um, being absorbed by the Earth, and as it was being released, it was being released as sort of um, heat and sort of a lower frequency, and that that lower frequency heat wasn't able to escape back out into space at, at the rate that it was before. It was getting trapped by these denser, um, these denser molecules in the Earth's atmosphere, and the result was a gradual but, but real warming of the Earth's climate. And both of those problems represent sort of a classic public goods problem, the kind of collective action problem we've been talking about all semester long, right? That if you're going to respond to these sorts of problems, it's going to probably require lots of different actors taking lots of different steps and contributing lots of different resources to produce a solution that will benefit the whole planet. But because a solution would benefit the whole planet, we potentially had that free rider problem where states or individuals might opt not to contribute to the global sort of collective effort, but instead just enjoy the benefits. And so it's, it's worth looking at how these two different problems were addressed. So in 1987, the international commu community came together and signed under what became known as the Montreal Protocol um, that would reduce the use of chlorofluorocarbons. Um, and there were a couple components of this that made this agreement very successful. In fact, um, projections now are that by about 2050, so about 30 years uh, from now, the Earth's ozone layer will more or less be healed. I guess the way that healing works in this context is every time there's like a lightning strike, I shouldn't say every time, I don't know that, but lightning strikes can have the effect of fusing oxygen molecules together in such a way that creates ozone, I guess. So nature will heal itself over time. The problem was just removing from the um, industrial processes and from human consumption, these chlorofluorocarbons. Um, the mechanism that was put in place for this is to shift away from chlorofluorocarbons to over to what are called hydrochlorofluorocarbons, which don't bond with oxygen. They're more expensive, but they were workable. And there were funds that were uh, it was created by rich countries to help subsidize poor countries as they worked toward this. There was a timeline put in place. There were targets put in place. And there was an oversight and monitoring system put in place where states agreed to share their efforts at reducing um, chlorofluorocarbons from, from their economies. So in general, Montreal Protocol seems to have worked as it pulled states together into making contributions that address this common collective problem. Around the same time, um, countries met in Rio uh, for the 1992 Earth Summit and established a framework convention on climate change. This was essentially an agreement for how countries would work together to respond to climate change over the coming years. Countries were not committing themselves to any reductions at that point. They were committing themselves to a process of investigating how to come up with reductions in the future. This is something the United States um, signed and ratified. President Bush Sr. signed it and submitted it to the Senate, and it was ratified by a voice vote. It wasn't even, you know, a, a roll call vote. They just sort of adopted it um, by more or less consensus. Um, 
But again, it doesn't necessarily address the problem. The next step in that global climate change process that was laid out in Rio um, came with the negotiation of an international convention in Kyoto, Japan. And I think by and large, the Kyoto process was, I wouldn't say a failure, but certainly didn't get the planet to where it needed to be in terms of addressing um, global warming through, um, through greenhouse gases. And part of that is that many of the important economic players that needed to be part of that process just weren't really interested in, in contributing. And I'm thinking particularly the United States and China. China at this point looked at global warming and said, this is the kind of problem that belongs to wealthy countries. Wealthy countries put most of the um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, they need to figure out how to make this, this work. And we're not going to, you know, limit our economic development and growth to address this problem. The United States' response was if China's not participating, the U.S. isn't really participating. Um, there was a lot of fixation on identifying what was the appropriate target rather than how you could get there and whether it was a realistic um, timeline and pathway. Um, and I think there was a, a real sense that an agreement had to be in place and so a lot of big questions were left unresolved by Kyoto. Um, and as a result, the agreement didn't really deliver the kind of reductions in global um, use of greenhouse gases. Uh, in 2009, um, countries met again in Copenhagen. And this, from my perspective, marks a real turning point in, in global climate change um, cooperation. And it, what, what facilitated a movement at this um, meeting was conversations that had been starting between President Obama in um, the United States and, and, and the Chinese leadership, suggesting that maybe they were going to have to work together on this and, and find a pathway forward. Um, at this point, China was now either the largest greenhouse gas emitter or um, would soon be. And I think there was a sense that China, China had to be part of this, this solution, that they couldn't just simply pass it on to rich countries. And as a result, you get these meetings between the United States and China at the Copenhagen meeting, in which both the United States and China pledge to take um, concrete steps, and they agree to work together on this. And the goal is to forge a grand bargain, right? That, that uh, the, the powerful actors, the critical actors are committing and they're on board, and they're making um, a plan for working forward on this rather than getting to a single solution right now at one moment, right? The, the treaty is secondary. That'll come later. What matters now is that the United States and China and others are committing to take steps and are working toward this goal and now have a common project that they're working on um, that they can continue to check in on and, and validate year after year after year. There's no real enforcement mechanisms other than that sense of you've committed to this, you committed to me to this, I'm watching, we're going to be checking in and, and cooperating on this. And so for the next six or so years, every year, the United States and China and others would meet at these global climate change meetings and they would sort of report on what they had done and they would identify what the next step is and they would take those next steps and working deliberatively through a sort of a, a tit for tat uh, reciprocity kind of dynamic, we're able to build a level of trust and sense that everybody was sort of working toward this common goal that really allowed for a 2015 um, agreement at Paris that would really formalize what was already happening. It formalized the cooperation that was in place between the United States and China and others to bring down greenhouse gas emissions. And so the Copenhagen um, process essentially gets formalized in Paris and sort of lays out in a more um, precise way the timetables for transitioning economies away from fossil fuels. Um, there's an oversight and monitoring piece, but there's not necessarily an enforcement piece. It's really just, again, the idea that states are going to be making these cuts and they're going to figure out what's the most effective way to do this. Um, the agreement goes into effect, um, and I think it's maybe worth highlighting a little bit about how, how this worked exactly. Um, the agreement goes into effect because enough member states that were part of the Rio agreement signed on and ratified it. And they, it wasn't just the number of states, it was also states representing a certain share of global carbon emissions. And because the United States had signed onto that initial agreement in Rio, uh, President Obama asserted that the United States was bound by this agreement even though it wasn't ratified by the United States Senate, the U.S. Senate had ratified that initial agreement back in 1992. Um, 
but in effect, the agreement will continue to operate as an international treaty in which most states had signed on to and were part of, but also this compact with the United States continued to work collaboratively with other states through the Paris process toward these goals. Um, President Trump, in the first year he took office, um, withdrew the United States from the um, Paris Climate Agreement, as well as undid a number of the steps that President Barack Obama had taken to move the United States toward um, reduced uh, carbon emissions. In fact, the United States was about two thirds of the way toward its goal of reducing climate uh, er, greenhouse gas emissions when President Trump took office. Um, but the agreement hasn't sort of uh, torn itself apart. Um, because of that, the agreement continues to remain in effect. Other states are working toward that. And in fact, within the United States, there's still considerable movement toward those Paris uh, climate goals. Um, a number of states, including California, um, have committed themselves to being able to stay on track with the Paris Agreement. A number of companies, that, particularly multinational companies that operate in multiple parts of the world, have sort of decided that they're going to have to be able to be in alignment with the timeline and the timetable set up by Paris. And so companies and, and energy corporations are working to shift their their um, production and, and consumption in a way that's going to be sustainable with the Paris Climate Agreement. So on the whole, we, we get two different agreements. One was fairly successful right off the bat. One didn't necessarily um, deliver the kind of um, simple and straightforward treaty that would allow for us to get success. Instead, what we saw was a pattern of using regular meetings to build a sense of momentum that then made an agreement possible as a way to formalize what was happening rather than lay out what will happen. 